Welcome aboard. Welcome to another tour. Today, we are in Da Nang, Vietnam. There are many important and interesting places from the Second Indochina War, or more commonly known as the Vietnam War. But today, we're going to visit Khe San and the Khe San Combat Base. The location where a remote combat base was under siege for 77 days. Let's get the plane started. I'll get the cockpit set up. We'll get this tour underway. Today, we are going to Khe San. In a movement such as this, the United States Marines head for security duty in South Vietnam. Their landing is at a beach north of Da Nang, where they will guard the American jet airfield against attack by Viet Cong guerrillas and infiltrators from North Vietnam, only 80 miles away. They land in full battle gear, but meet no opposition from the guerrillas known to be in the area. Others of the 3,500 Marines are to come by air transport. Their duty will be strictly defensive, but they will shoot back if attacked. Marines usually do. The Vietnam War took place in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia from 1955 to 1975. The war was between North and South Vietnam, but it served as a Cold War proxy war and involved the United States, South Korea, the Soviet Union, and China. The war followed the first Indochina War between the French and the communist-led Viet Minh. We are currently at the Da Nang International Airport. It has the airport code VVDN, and it's located here in Da Nang. It's the largest city in central Vietnam, located on the flat ground on the south side of the major port here in Da Nang. It was originally built by the French uh, during their colonial period in the 1940s as a civilian airport. During World War II, in the Japanese occupation of French Indochina, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force used it as a military base. After the war, the facility was used by the French Air Force during the French Indochina War from 1945 to 1954. During the Vietnam War from 1959 to 1975, the facility was known as the Da Nang Air Base and was a major United States military base. The airport was expanded to 2,350 acres with two 10,000 foot asphalt runways. As we will talk about today, our destination, Khe San Combat Base, and the battle there, American commanders had hoped it was going to be the military strategic turning point of the war, but what many say now turned out to be the major political turning point of the war. As we taxi here today, if this is your first time, welcome aboard. What I do is I find interesting places to talk about and fly over, and then we find them here in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Today, we are flying the Embraer EMB-110. We are at the runway. We are ready for takeoff. Fasten your seatbelts. Hold on to your drinks, we will be in the air shortly.
are airborne as we depart Da Nang here. Da Nang is the largest city here in central Vietnam, located here on the South China Sea. It's an important port city, and it's the commercial and educational center for all of central Vietnam. In March of 1965, the first U.S. Marines in Vietnam came ashore here in Da Nang. Members of the 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade came ashore to secure the airport here. Many historians say that Khe San was indeed the turning point, at least as far as the American support for the war went at home. And today, as we fly northwest uh, to what was southern Vietnam at the time, to the area of Khe San, uh, located here was the combat base, and it took its name from the nearby village of Khe San. In 1968, the Khe San combat base was under siege for over 70 days from a North Vietnamese force believed to be at least a division in size. We will tour the area of Khe San. We will attempt to find the location of the former combat base and airstrip. We will talk about how it came to be that elements of the U.S. 26 Marines ended up in that remote section of what at the time was known as I-Corps Tactical Zone. The Khe San Combat Base was located on a relatively flat plateau in the extreme northwest corner of what was South Vietnam at the time in the Quang Tri Province, part of the I-Corps Tactical Zone, ICTZ. Bordered on the north by the Demilitarization Zone, DMZ, and on the west by the border with Laos, the Marines' operational area encompassed 1,554 square kilometers of the Hoang Hoa District. The base was used to support surveillance operations and to counter North Vietnamese troops crossing the DMZ or moving along the supply route known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The remote base took its name from the nearby village of Khe San, a collection of about nine small hamlets along Route 9. Route 9 was the only east-west road in this northern province, joining Laos with the coastal region in the east. Supplying the base in Khe San was done via Route 9, and it was the only overland route to the Khe San area. Although Route 9 from Dong Ha in the east to the Khe San area, Route 9 was basically 63 kilometers of crumbling one-lane road. Washed out areas, cliffs with no guardrails, overgrown foliage, rock slides, and 36 bridges dating back to the French colonial period in Vietnam. Actually starting at Cam Lo, cart path may have been a better description for Route 9. The Americans' first involvement in the base at Khe San started back in 1962 when Special Forces Team A-131 established a camp at an abandoned French fort along Route 9. It was about two kilometers from the village of Khe San. The Old French Fort, as it was referred to, was used as a base of operations for recruiting and training local Bru Montagnards into the CIDG program, CIDG, which stood for Civilian Irregular Defense Group Program, that trained irregular South Vietnamese military units. Two years later, that camp was moved from the fort to a small airstrip that had been built by the French in 1949. In 1964, Marine Detachment Advisory Team 1 established a radio monitoring site north of the camp. Throughout 1966 and 1967, the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force conducted battalion size operations in the area. During that time, the U.S. Army Special Forces relocated to the village of Lang Ve on Route 9, about 8 kilometers from the Laotian border. The Special Forces would later establish a forward operating base, FOB, in the corner of the Khe San base in late 1967. Also around that time, a detachment from the Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 10 began extending and improving the runway. This project resurfaced the existing 457 meter runway and added an additional 732 meters to it. It also constructed a parking apron. Company B, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines was positioned at the base to protect this project, replacing the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines who had been in the area alongside elements of the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion. The situation in Vietnam in 1967 leading up to the events at Khe San included the tension between Marine commanders and the U.S. Army General William Westmoreland, who was the commander of all U.S. forces in Vietnam. The Marines were responsible for the five most northern provinces, although from 1965 to 1966 the Marines had paid little attention to Khe San due to its remote location from the populated areas. Marine commanders believed the success in Vietnam would be its effort at pacification, 
These commanders were Lieutenant General Lewis Walt, commander of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, MAF, and Lieutenant General Victor Krulak, commander of the Fleet Marine Force Pacific. They based their strategy on the Marine Corps' Small Wars Manual and believed that the real war lay within the villages of South Vietnam. This strategy, as described by the Marine Corps Commandant, was the spreading ink blot strategy. Through the combined action program, a squad of Marines and two squads of Vietnamese soldiers from a combined action platoon could secure a village, and by improving the quality of life, you could weaken the hold of the village by the Liberation Army of South Vietnam, better known as the Viet Cong, a contraction of the term Vietnamese Communist in Vietnamese. Once a village was secure and the locals were trained to defend themselves, this security could be expanded out from there, hence a spreading ink blot. General Westmoreland did not discount this strategy, but he placed more emphasis on a search-and-destroy approach in which U.S. forces leave these bases and enclaves and villages to locate and defeat large Viet Cong and NVA North Vietnamese Army units. Back in early 1966, intelligence gathered from surveillance aircraft, increased attacks on the Arvin Army of the Republic of Vietnam, and information from captured North Vietnamese prisoners indicated the North Vietnam's 324th B Division had moved into the northwest region of South Vietnam. The Marines currently in the region were still having little contact with the enemy, which caused General Walt of the MAF and General Wood Kyle, the 3rd Marine Division commander, to be skeptical that there really was a large NVA presence in the area. That notion would slowly change with the increased attacks in the area, this and heavy fighting that was now taking place during Operation Hastings and Operation Prairie. Even with the increase of attacks and contact, the Marine commanders believed that the NVA presence in the area was more of a distraction from the Marines' main mission of pacification, that spreading inkblot approach. General Westmoreland, on the other hand, believed that, in addition to the 324th B Division, there were at least two other divisions now in the area of the DMZ. His fear was that these divisions could maneuver around the existing Marine forces to the west and open up a corridor from Laos into the Khe Sanh area and gain use of Route 9. And this, he believed, is why they couldn't allow the Khe Sanh area to fall into NVA control. Westmoreland now wanted the Marines to send an entire battalion to Khe Sanh. Westmoreland believed that holding Khe Sanh would allow his U.S. troops to engage large NVA units supported by artillery and tactical air support without the complexity of the many populated civilian locations in southern Vietnam. General Westmoreland's strategy that competed with the Marines' pacification strategy was that if the U.S. could defeat a large NVA force in the Northwest, it would be the quickest means to winning the war. The Marine commanders tried to dissuade Westmoreland from sending more Marines into Khe Sanh. Brigadier General Lowell English, the assistant commander of the 3rd Marine Division, expressed his opinion that in every fight in the northern Huang Tri province where the enemy had appeared in large units, they had been clobbered, as he said. I don't believe the enemy is that stupid that he's going to come down here across the DMZ in regimental strength or even divisional strength and give you the opportunity to annihilate him. Westmoreland was appeased on 30 September 1966 and Major Peter Wickwire's 1st Battalion 3rd Marines were sent to Khe Sanh Combat Base. That combat base and the surrounding hills are our destination today. We hope to find the plateau where it was located and where the airstrip once was. That battalion would remain there until January of 1967 when they were replaced by a company from the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. A single company was now going to replace a battalion, and that was Captain Michael Sayers, Company B, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. In addition to Bravo Company, there was a platoon from the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion. There was also one artillery battery, Battery I, from the 3rd Battalion, 12th Marines, for artillery support. Wickwire's company was now responsible for protecting the airstrip and patrolling. After their arrival and increased enemy contact, Brigadier General Michael Ryan, the new assistant commander of the 3rd Marine Division, sent Captain William Terrell's Company E, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines to Quezon as well. These are the Marines that would go on to be engaged in the fighting around Quezon to take the hills or the high ground that looked down onto the base, as well as the avenues of approach from the DMZ in Laos. 
These battles for these hills would simply become known as the Hill Fights, or as others refer to them as the First Battle of Quezon. A lot has been written about these hill fights of 1967, although the siege of Quezon in 1968 seems to get more attention, these hill fights were an important part of the Quezon story. One of the fears that the American commanders and politicians had was that Quezon could turn out to be a repeat of the events in Dien Bien Phu in 1954. In 1954, the Viet Minh, forces of Ho Chi Minh, launched an assault against the 13,000 entrenched French troops. Even with massive air support, the French position collapsed and began the end of French colonialism in Indochina. Whether this was the intent of the North Vietnamese army or not, intelligence did confirm that large elements of the People's Army of Vietnam Pavan, including elements from the 325th Sea Division, had moved into the northern Quang Tri province. It appeared that these enemy troops were preparing an attack on Khe San from Hill 861 and Hill 881. The military designation for hills is based on their height in meters. On April 24th, a chance engagement took place that caused the NBA and the U.S. Marines to become embattled, and this was just days before the NBA had planned to launch their attack. Just briefly, the event that started these hill fights and possibly prevented the NBA from executing any plan on their timetable was on April 24th, the 1st and 3rd platoons from Company Bravo, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, went out to sweep some caves near Hill 861. The 2nd platoon was to move to Hill 700 to supply cover. Once on top of Hill 700, they sent a five-person squad to the summit of Hill 861 to establish an observation post. That squad, on its way to 861, was ambushed, and only one person survived. When Private First Class William Marks made it back to the 2nd Platoon, he reported, they're all dead. 1st and 3rd Platoons were then diverted to move to the summit of Hill 861. The Marines then came under attack from a large, dug-in NBA force. In this contact would be the opening to what was known as the Hill Fights. The result of these intense fights were that the Marine commanders and General Walt now believed that the real fight was in Quezon. Brutal fighting? took place around the area for the next few days with little success. Eventually a plan was developed to spend two days pounding the hills with artillery and airstrikes, and then the 2nd Battalion would seize Hill 861, and the 3rd Battalion would take Hill 881 south. After 2nd Battalion secured Hill 861, it would move to 881 north. The fighting would be intense, but the hills would be secured by May 5th, and follow-on operations would take place until May 11th. Intelligence then determined that these NBA units had moved northwest across the Laos border and across the DMZ. After these battles, the 2nd Battalion and 3rd Battalion of the 3rd Marines were replaced by the 1st Battalion 26th Marines at Quezon. Colonel David Lowndes assumed command of the regiment at Quezon in August, and the battalion had very little contact with the enemy. All of that summer and into the fall, they swept the area looking for signs of enemy buildup, but nothing was found. The 75-man CB detachment was rebuilding the airstrip at this time, and the 1st Radio Battalion established a listening post on Hill 881 South. In November of 1967, intelligence units detected that elements of the North Vietnamese 304th and 320th Divisions were moving along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. Westmoreland believed they were moving towards Khe San. He believed Khe San was going to be the NBA's major battleground for a winter offensive. With increased enemy sightings and discovery of a new bunker complex on Hill 881 North, probing attacks on Hill 861, it was clear that large units of the NVA had moved back into the area. In January 1968, the U.S. Marine Air Command launched Operation Niagara to find and eliminate NVA units around Quezon. It was called a SLAM operation, Seek, Locate, Annihilate, and Monitor. Also in January of that year, 20 Sikorsky SH-3 Sea King helicopters from the 21st Helicopter Squadron started dropping acoustic sensors in an operation that was codenamed Muscle Shoals. These devices were dropped along suspected routes of infiltration and detected enemy movement. At this point, Major General Rath Von Tompkins of the 3rd Marine Division decided to send the 2nd Battalion 26 Marines to reinforce Khe San. He believed that the North Vietnamese general, Vo Nguyen Zap, was beginning an offensive action similar to the one that was disrupted in 1967, but this one appeared to be on a larger scale. 
It was later estimated that the NBA had stockpiled enough supplies and equipment and ammunition to support over 20,000 troops in Quezon. The NBA task force included the 304th and the 325th Sea Infantry Divisions with one battalion of local forces. It had two artillery regiments, the 675th and the 45th, and one anti-aircraft artillery regiment, the 241st. There was also a light tank battalion, engineers, and six transportation battalions. The North Vietnamese tightened their noose around Khe San, and one of the first skirmishes occurred near Hill 881 South. On January 18th, Company B, 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion, was ambushed near Hill 881 North. The Marines at this time on the hills around Khe San all agreed you could just tell something was about to happen. From Hill 881 South, Captain Dabney's I Company was sent to reconnaissance Hill 881 North. Captain Dabney would later explain that we got about halfway to 881 North. He said maybe about a thousand meters from 881 South when the shit hit the fan in every sense of the word. Even with the call for fire support and artillery, they failed to take Hill 881 North and eventually were directed back to 881 South so they broke contact and returned. Around this same time, 2nd Platoon, Company B, 1st Battalion, captured an NBA soldier from the 95th Sea Regiment, 325th Sea Division. He provided detailed information on the plan of attack on Khe San. The attack would start with an assault on Hill 861 that night and the combat base the following day. That night, Corporal Dennis Mannion recalls about 20.30, 8.30 p.m., it got really dark and we could hear North Vietnamese outside the wire. We could hear them giving orders and the clicking sound of them cutting through our wire perimeter. Soon after that, the attack of Hill 861 began with RPGs. By midnight, the hill would be blanketed by mortar fire, and the Vietnamese 6th Battalion, 95C Regiment, 325th Division launched the attack. The Marines fought through the night on Hill 861, and on January 21st, at first light around 0530, 5.30 a.m., a massive bombardment hit Khe San Combat Base. The siege of Khe San was now underway, and the roughly 6,000 U.S. troops, mostly Marines, with some Army, Air Force, and Navy personnel, were in for a long few months. The code name for the defense of Khe San was Operation Scotland. This remote outpost now had the attention of even the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. Should it be held or quietly abandoned was the question. We are now approaching the Khe San region. The plateau uh, where the combat base was and the surrounding hills. Just north of us here is the DMZ, the Demilitarization Zone, and just west of us is the Loatian border and the Ho Chi Minh Trail that was named after the North Vietnamese President Ho Chi Minh. Here where we see where the airstrip was, behind that would have been the Marine Air Traffic Control and behind that was the 26th Marines Command Post. At the end of the strip, was the main ammo dump number one. Towards the front, there was FOB 3, which was occupied by the Army Special Forces. And within the perimeter, there were also uh, artillery batteries of the 13th Marines. At the time, the Marines also held Hill 881 South and 861. There was also a radio relay station on Hill 950. The 2nd Battalion, 26 Marines, held Hill 558 in a blocking position of the Rao Quan River Valley. The North Vietnamese forces were well dug into the north, including on Hill 881 North. Shortly after the bombardment began at 0530 with 122 millimeter rockets, artillery and mortars, that main ammo dump at the end of the runway was hit. Now, in addition to the incoming fire, 1,500 tons of munition were now exploding and going off all around the base inside the perimeter for the next 48 hours, wounding and killing Marines. This also meant the major portion of the munitions for defense of the base were now destroyed. The Marines and the North Vietnamese were now in a long-range gun battle. Question for the 26th Marine Commander, Colonel David Lowndes, and the rest of the Marines at Khe San was, when would a ground attack be launched against the base? Surprisingly, when the first attack came, it was launched against the Khe San village itself, three kilometers south of the base. It was estimated that a battalion-sized element from the NVA was attacking the village. Also, Hill 861, which had been receiving artillery, rocket, and mortar rounds, was attacked by ground forces. 
The forces defending Khaesan Village were 175 soldiers and marines, including two platoons of South Vietnamese from the 915th Regional Force Company, a small detachment of Navy, and a number of Bru Montagnard tribesmen. The defenses in the village were attacked under the cover of fog. The defenders started calling in close air support, stating that they had NVA in the wire. An attempt to reinforce the village with a South Vietnamese 256th Regional Force by helicopter went terribly wrong, as the helicopters of the U.S. Army's 282nd Assault Helicopters set down. The 11th Company of the NVA's 66th Regiment opened up fire from well camouflage trenches. This laid devastating deadly fire on both the South Vietnamese troops and the American pilots. The next day, Colonel Lowndes made the decision to abandon the village. Back at the base, things were busy. The 26th Marines Fire Support Coordination Center, the FSCC, which was located next to the Combat Operations Center, was in full operation. They coordinated the artillery, fire direction control, the aircraft with Direct Air Support Center, the DASC, and also target intelligence, determining enemy targets. Later in the siege, General Westmoreland, against the will of the local Marine commanders, as well as the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Leonard Chapman, would place Marine Corps aviation under the consolidated control by the Air Force. On January 22nd, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, was brought into the defense of Quezon. They would be followed by the addition of the 37th Arvin Ranger Battalion. All of these forces were now engaged in the operation of the base, maintaining outgoing fire and digging in. Quezon was going to make the transition from bunkers above ground to underground. Trenches, trench systems, and underground bunkers would become their new home. Incoming rounds were now hitting the airstrip and destroying the CH-46 helicopters located at the base. One of the first critical tasks was to resupply ammunition after losing most of the base's ammunition when ammo dump one was hit. Runway repairs were being made by the Navy Seabees and in the following two days, 130 tons of ammo were delivered. As the base and the defensive positions on the surrounding hills prepared, General Westmoreland was informing the president that Quezon could be the turning point for the whole war. President Johnson was very concerned. He did not want to have an American version of Dien Bien Phu. The air war was a large part of the battle at Quezon and in what gave U.S. commanders confidence that Quezon could be defended. Intelligence gathered from the sensors, surveillance flights, and special forces were fed into the targeting process to pinpoint and target large concentration of NVA troops. Operation Niagara II started on January 22nd, with 595 tactical strikes from the Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy fighter bombers, as well as 49 sorties by the B-52 Stratofortress, delivering the ordnance on a 24-hour basis. By the time Niagara II comes to an end, more than 24,000 tactical strike sorties will have been flown, 2,500 B-52 sorties will have flown, and they'll have dropped more than 95,000 tons of ordnance. The B-52 missions, known as arc light strikes, carry 27 tons of ordnance, consisting of 250, 500, and 750 pound bombs. Initially, the safety zone around these arc light strikes, meaning how close they could drop them to friendly troops, was three kilometers. The North Vietnamese knew this and they used that three kilometers to maneuver and store ammunition. By the end of February, that policy was changed. Using MSQ-77 combat sky spot radar to direct the tactical strikes by the B-52s, they were brought in as close as 1,000 meters from the perimeter. ASRT Bravo, Air Support Radar Team Bravo, used ANTPQ-10 radar to control the close air support. This accurate guidance between the radar team and the pilot is credited with the defense of Quezon. This radar system that arrived at Quezon on the 16th of January and started operating on 20 January could deliver strikes within 50 meters of U.S. troops. The ongoing airstrikes were carried out by Marine, Navy, and Air Force McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantoms, Marine and Navy A-6 Intruders, A-4 Skyhawks, and Vought F-8 Crusaders, as well as Air Force Republic F-105 Thunder Chiefs, North American F-100 Super Sabres, and the South Vietnamese Douglas A-1 Sky Raiders. You get the picture. The air support was staggering in magnitude and complexity. 
On January 30th and 31st, the Viet Cong launched what is known as the Tet Offensive, named for the Lunar New Year Festival, which normally brought a ceasefire. 80,000 Viet Cong and Pavin troops attacked towns, cities, and military installations across southern Vietnam. General Westmoreland believed that Tet was just a diversion and that Khe Sanh and the I Corps zone was still the greatest area of threat. In a 1969 interview, General Zapp was asked if he intended to make Khe Sanh the next Dien Bien Phu. He stated it was not and that Khe Sanh wasn't all that important. He stated that Khe Sanh was only important because the Americans made it important. Because as he said, it was important for the Americans whose prestige was at stake. The North Vietnamese forces around Khe Sanh had an accomplished and amazing feat. The fact that the North Vietnamese forces were able to get these large guns into such remote places around Khe Sanh, along with all the troops, supplies, and ammo, was an amazing logistical feat. They had placed their shorter range guns all within a few kilometers of the base. Their longer range pieces were located just over the border in Laos. These were being fired from Hill 305, as well as caves dug into the side of the Koh Rock Mountain. Most of the rockets were fired from Hill 881 North. The benefit the North Vietnamese had were these long-range guns in Laos could reach the Khe Sanh base, but none of the American guns, even the big guns at Camp Carroll, could not reach them. As the siege ran on for weeks, more than 150 North Vietnamese rounds would land on the base every day. Actually, on February 23rd, this rate would hit its peak of 1,300 incoming rounds in a single day. On February 3rd and 4th, the U.S. electronic sensors detected a large NVA formation on the move, and it appeared to be making a move for Hill 881 South. A massive Niagara raid was launched, and large NVA units were caught in the open. The 13th Marines guns at Quezon, as well as the 175mm guns at Camp Carroll were now targeting these forces. This whole scene was witnessed by Marines on Hill 861 Alpha, a small outpost. But two battalions from this group being targeted managed to split away and would launch an assault on Hill 861 Alpha. And that fight would be ferocious, and as Captain Earl Breeding, commander of Company E, 2nd Battalion, 26th Marine said, fighting was close and personal, sometimes hand to hand, just like in a World War II movie. The Marines would go on to repel multiple attacks against the hill, and Quezon artillery would prevent any NBA reinforcements from reaching the fight. As the big gun battle raged on between U.S. forces and the NVA, the North Vietnamese 304th Division started maneuvering to clear ground approaches to the base. The first objective, this was the Special Forces Camp at Lang Bay. 15,000 NVA troops from the 66th Regiment, backed with tanks, attacked the base. The base was overrun in only a few hours. They now also had control of Route 9. By controlling this route, it allowed them to get their 130mm guns even closer to the base. In conjunction with this, an elaborate trench system was now being dug towards the base's perimeter. Just like at Dien Bien Phu, the North Vietnamese were employing siege tactics straight from the Middle Ages. As the Marines had dug in and prepared for a ground attack, the full-scale ground attack had not come. The NBA only conducted small perimeter probing attacks. It was still basically an artillery and aircraft battle. Another aspect to the battle that was going on at Khe Sanh was resupply. Damage to the runway, incoming fire, and even weather made the air supply of ammo, food, water, medical supplies a real challenge. Maintaining this incoming supply line, known as an air bridge at the time, was critical to the base's survival. The base required over 200 tons of supplies a day just to keep up with the fight. The workhorse of this air bridge was the Lockheed Martin KC-130 Hercules. The C-130 could carry up to 20 tons of cargo. The problem was this large aircraft took almost the entire runway at Khe Sanh to land, then it could turn around, unload, and take off again. On February 10th, a Hercules was hit by heavy machine gun fire as it landed. The C-130 was piloted by Chief Warrant Officer 3 Henry Wildfang and Major Robert White. The plane was carrying among its cargo flamethrowers and bulk fuel in large bladders. With the plane on fire and the cockpit full of oily black smoke, the pilot was still able to land the aircraft and maneuver it clear of the runway. The North Vietnamese continued to target the aircraft even after it was on the ground. This C-130 was a total loss. Following this, other pilots developed a technique known as speed offloading. The plane would land, but it would never stop moving. The cargo would just be rolled off the back of the plane while still in motion. What used to take 10 minutes with a fork truck now took 30 seconds. Part of this air bridge, in addition to the C-130s, were the C-123K Provider and the C-7 Caribou. A second C-130 
that had been attacked while landing was heavily damaged but also able to land. They were able to repair this aircraft overnight at the base and it was able to fly out the next day. When the aircraft returned from Quezon, it had 242 bullet holes in it. Following that, General Momeyer of the 7th Air Force ordered the field closed to all Air Force 130s. Ten days later, the Marine Corps would do the same for its C-130s. Since the smaller C-123 and C-7s could not meet the demand of Quezon, the supply operation moved to a parachute drop method for delivery. Just outside the perimeter, a 300 by 500 meter drop zone was established. Company C and Company A of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, had the dangerous recovery mission. They would be the ones to go out into the drop zone and retrieve the pallets. A morning drop of five to six planes, then recovery under sniper fire and occasional ambush, and then repeat the process in the afternoon and in the evening. This operation called for very tight coordination with the Marine Air Traffic Control at Quezon. The pilots were guided by the controller to know exactly when to release the cargo. At the precise moment, the pilots would pitch the plane up about eight degrees, and the cargo pallets, which rested on top of rollers in the floor, would roll out the back of the aircraft. The task of resupplying the hill outposts was even more difficult. Marine helicopters attempted to keep the hills supplied under heavy fire from the NBA. Anti-aircraft fire all the way in and all the way out, and mortars the entire time they were on the ground. Constant bombardment, limited rations, casualties, filth, rats, oh, and 20,000 NBA troops that could attack the base at any time. Quezon Combat Base was not a place you wanted to be. The NVA fortification and trench system that was on and around Hill 471 just south of the base was rapidly being extended north within 25 yards of the perimeter. Another system was being built from the east. Based on the weather and the moon, a late February attack was the most likely. Artillery, bombs, and napalm were relentlessly dropped on the trench system with very little effect. The trench system was well laid out and it used the terrain and existing vegetation patterns to blend in and hide it from aerial reconnaissance. The final solution was the B-52 raids that were allowed to bomb the trench system with close-in bombing. A sudden increase in radioactivity from the North Vietnamese and heavy trucks of supplies on Route 9 from the Laos border had the Marines believe that the attack was near. The 66th Regiment from the 304th Division was massing on a plantation south of the base, as well as the location of the old French fort. On February 29th, a battalion of NVA attacked the South Vietnamese 37th Rangers on the east side of the base. B-52s, just arriving, were diverted away from their original targets and now targeted enemy approaches on the east side of the base. Following the B-52 strikes, the Quezon fire plan was unleashed. The artillery of Quezon fired and formed what looked like an open-ended box, boxing in the enemy that was approaching. Then, a sweeping barrage was walked up and down the inside of the box. Then, the 175mm guns at the rock pile in Camp Carroll created a moving outer cordon. Those troops that did survive this were then engaged by the South Vietnamese Rangers. The NVA would go on to attack the Rangers several times in March, including one battalion size attack on March 18th. Eventually, the attack subsided, and it was discovered that many of the NVA troops in the area had made their way back towards the DMZ or the border. There would still be some serious engagements, such as a push from the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, to take Hill 471, which was just 2,500 meters south of the airstrip, and overlooked Route 9. Other fights to be had were Company G, 2nd Battalion, 26 Marines fight to take the ridgeline that ran from Hill 861 towards the base, and many other operations were now underway to attack out of the base south against NVA bunker complexes. The Marines were now on the offense. From the east of I Corps, the 1st Air Cavalry Division's 3rd Brigade was working to clear Route 9 west to Quezon, followed by the 1st Marines. This push to Quezon was named Operation Pegasus. On April 6th, when the Army's 2nd Battalion, 12th Cavalry landed on Hill 471 and assumed responsibilities for its security, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines became the first defenders of Quezon to be relieved. For the South Vietnamese at Quezon, the Arvin 84th Company 8th Airborne Battalion landed by helicopter and linked up with the 37th Ranger Battalion. The offensive operations would continue around Quezon 
including the capturing of the Old French Fort by the 2nd Brigade of the 1st Air Cavalry Division after a three-day battle. As enemy contact dwindled and more and more enemy equipment was discovered abandoned, it became clear the enemy had fled the area. The much-awaited link-up of the relief forces and Quezon defenders on Quezon Combat Base itself took place at 0800 on April 8th when the Army's 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, entered the base along the Coffee Plantation Road. 1st Lieutenant Joseph Abadili of Company D, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, said, My platoon was the first to walk into Quezon. I blew a cavalry charge on an old bugle that had been captured from the NVA. Although a large portion of the NVA had withdrawn, there was still plenty of enemy in the area and they were well dug in. Fighting would go on for weeks around the base. On June 19th, Task Force Hotel began Operation Charlie, the 3rd Marine Division's plan for evacuation and destruction of Quezon Combat Base. That was our tour of the Quezon area, the hills, and the combat base. Let's make our way back to the East Coast. Our final destination today is the Fubai International Airport, which is located just south of the city of Wei. There is some debate about the number of casualties sustained or inflicted by either side. And you can find a lot of that information online. But this was more about the events that took place and where they took place here in Quezon and how the Marines ended up there. The siege at Quezon, as well as the Tet Offensive, many say, was the political turning point for American support for the war in Vietnam. We will be on the ground shortly. Thanks for joining me today on the tour. The cost of today's tour is pretty simple. If you could just reach down and hit that subscribe button, I would really appreciate it. It does help the channel. If you're already subscribed, thank you. Maybe you could share the channel with somebody you know that might be interested. As always, everything we talked about today was just my own research. So if you have comments or corrections, please leave me a comment below. West corner of South Vietnam, nestled among 4,000 foot high mountains, steep ravines, and thick jungle foliage, rests the small valley of Khe San. At this time in history, it is calm and peaceful. But from January 21st to March 31st, 1968, it was the scene of one of the most bitterly fought and highly publicized battles of the Vietnam War. For 70 days and nights, a determined group of 6,000 Marines and Allied troops held out against a besieging force of 20,000 North Vietnamese. Was Khe San worth it? Why did the U.S. military command feel it necessary to defend this outpost? This is its story. Welcome to Phu Bai International Airport here just outside the city of Hue, Vietnam. The International Airport here has the airport code VVPB.
Let's find a place to park the aircraft, shut it down, and we will take a look around the airport. Bye. Uh...